any number of civil suits against him, but we have no criminal charges and we have no real mechanism here to step in and seize his assets because there's no criminal charges pending. Um, let me compare that with a case that was decided just last year. This is Lochner versus Andrade. <clears throat> um, Andrade is somebody who stole <coughs> $85 worth of videos from Kmart. He seems to have ripped off Free Willy and Cinderella and a couple of others, stuffed him down his pants and tried to run out. He got caught. A couple of weeks later, he's in a different Kmart. He stuffed $70 worth of videos under his pants. He gets caught again. Um, he ends up being convicted on both charges. And California said, hey, you have this residential burglary charge back in 1983. You broke into a house and stole some stuff. Even though that's 15, almost 20 years ago now, that's strike one. You have another residential burglary from that same year. That's strike two. Your shoplifting charge is now strike three and strike four, and each strike carries a mandatory 50 years. So for these two instances of shoplifting, you just got 50 years in prison. Um, Andrade is 37 years old, so likely he's, this is basically a life sentence for him. If that's not screwed up enough, think about this as $25,000 to $35,000 a year to keep somebody locked up for that time, especially given the magnitude of his crime, and you have some understanding of why California has deep financial problems that they don't seem to be addressing in the right way. Um, part of this in holding up uh, Andrade's conviction, the Supreme Court reaffirmed Rommel versus Estelle, which is the case that we just discussed in the opening of our chapter. Um, Rommel had stolen $230 and got life in prison, so if we're going to affirm that, then somebody who has four strikes against them can certainly also do life in prison. The court said that 50 years in prison wasn't necessarily a life sentence because we didn't actually sentence him to life. And more than that, before you're going to say that this is grossly disproportionate to the crime, we need to make a stronger showing. The court said in the last paragraph of its opinion that disproportionality under the Eighth Amendment is reserved for truly exceptional cases, and $150 worth of videos in Kmart and a life sentence doesn't qualify as a truly extraordinary case. Grossly proportion, disproportionate means something else. Um, probably worse still, is we know that Andrade was stealing to support a drug habit. Uh, he was a heroin user, and we know from lots of folks that they are strongly addicted, which isn't good. They go out and steal and um, hawk stuff to try to get money for the next fix. I know at this point lots of people say, why didn't he just go to drug treatment? Why didn't he just quit? Um, it's kind of like the domestic violence argument. She was battered. Why shouldn't she just walk away? And we don't always understand that it's not quite that easy. Um, there's a wonderful book out by Charles Terry called The Fellas. Um, Chuck, was, Chuck is a convict criminologist, but he spent 10, 15 years in prisons through Oregon, California, Washington State for heroin addiction. He got out, got himself a PhD from University of California, Irvine, and is now a tenure-track faculty member. Um, but he's writing in his book about his experiences and the experiences of lots of other folks who have kind of do the drug and prison and theft route. Um, he writes in here of an arrest, and this is a quote from him. I made phone calls to various hospitals or recovery centers asking for help because I was hopelessly addicted. I was tired of the pain, the remorse, the sure knowledge that sooner or later I was going to end up back in prison. When someone on the other line answered, I'd say, hey, I need help. I'm a heroin addict who's already been in prison twice. I'm hooked like a dog. I'm doing felonies every day to support my habit, and I can't stop. In response came the inevitable question, do you have insurance? The cost is $500 a day for drug rehab. So when you kind of think, OK, he could have just gone and got it. Well, no, he tried that. He tried that any number of times, and that didn't work. And I don't want to say that the crimes were any less his responsibility. But part of what we're going to look at with Andy Fastow is, was this person a passive actor? Were they a very active ex actor in shaping the fraud? And this is important because it seems like Andrade isn't a criminal mastermind here. You know, he's somebody who is driven. He's probably somebody who's also sought help at any number of points and been denied because we don't have drug treatment on demand. We're willing to lock him up at $25,000 a year for 50 years 
but we're not willing ahead of time to provide some of the help that might have made him escape this kind of situation. Um, so I should probably talk just a little bit about Enron and then kind of move into Fastow and his sentence. Um, the previous section, I hope you got the sense that so far we haven't been doing really good with this equal protection of the laws. It does seem in lots of ways that if you're rich, you can commit all sorts of incredible crimes and get off. Ken Lay hasn't even got a slap on the wrist so far, so that's kind of an overstatement to go that far even. Um, so we do have this real problem with unequal justice, and Fastow at least seems like a counterexample. Um, I guess to make sense of this, and I won't go into too many details about how Enron worked, but the brief overview is that Enron did what it did because it took lots of loans and made those loans show up not as debt but as cash and revenue. Normally, if you, I go to the bank, I get my home improvement loan, that shows up in my credit as $13,000 that I am now in debt. This would be nice if I could somehow get somebody else to have the debt on their credit record and then they pay me the $13,000 so that I have the money but I don't have the debt. This is the wonder of Enron. This is off, all that off-balance sheet accounting and the off-balance sheet debt that you hear about. This is really kind of the structure that Andy Fastow pioneered. Um, to do this, you basically need to have kind of an independent business or as we'll see, something that pretends to be an independent business so they can get the loan and have the debt on their books and then they can give you the money for something. Um, because this money ultimately does have to be repaid, you kind of have to exchange something to make this look like it's not a loan. So what we see is lots of cases where this company would buy from Enron 10 years worth of gasoline and pay for it all up front. So they would give Enron $100 million for 10 years worth of gas. Enron would book the $100 million as revenue because, hey, we've sold something, we have cash flow, we have income, and they would cut another contract to sell this company back 10 years worth of gas just kind of regularly. So we have the company paying Enron, Enron pays back the company over time. The amount they pay is a little bit more than they got, which reflects interest, which basically means this is a loan. The fact that we've swapped gas back and forth doesn't change anything. The gas could not be there and the rest of the transaction would still work. Um, one of the interesting things that Enron was allowed to do is something called mark-to-market accounting where you can book the full value of a contract right when it happens. So if they cut a deal for something, they could kind of say, we expect to make $200 million off of this and book $200, $200 million as income. They say in their statements that it is based on reasonable assumptions of corporate executives but beyond that, you can pretty much guess the future value of the contract to be whatever you would like it to be. And given the pressure Enron was under to meet account, to meet expectations, the guidance they had given to Wall Street, they were trying to also inflate the stock price because a lot of these partnerships were supported with their stock. So they would try to be very aggressive in what they booked and what they said they would bring in. Um, part of the problem that this gets them into is that for each of these loans, they have to pay back the loan plus interest. And they also have to pay out fees for everybody involved in the deal. So you have a lot of Enron people working on this. You have people in this independent company who take a cut. And if you go to Citibank or whatever, they also have underwriting fees that they have to pay out. So you're really not just kind of $100 million in, but you've got to pay $100 million out plus fees for everybody who's involved in this. So when you go to do this again, you really need to borrow a lot more so you can pay off the first deal. And then that involves even more money, so the third time you do this, you have even more that you have to book. So you start doing a couple of these deals to support the one you've just done, and then the fees multiply and the interest multiplies. And along the way, people start to get kind of scared that you're borrowing a lot of money and have no cash flow of your own. So they want higher and higher returns for being willing to do this. So over time, Enron is piling up more and more debt, even as the actual business, the real income, is kind of lagging behind. This is kind of that analogy of the house of cards. And even Fastow admits at some point if the deals stop, the whole thing implodes. 